Have you ever felt? Are you listening? Damn. going to start our PowerPoint slow show as we usually do. And our background this time is a strategic map of our war with Spain. And that's the, of course the Spanish-American War of 1898. And here you can see the two main areas where we were involved with the Philippines and Cuba. And this was an imperialistic war because the U.S. was trying to create an empire at Spain's expense, basically taking over um, Spanish territory and making it our own. So this is an appropriate background for, for what we're studying today. U.S. US imperialism, that's why you hear the explosions, because it's about war, in part. Title is, title is Imperialism and War in America. I know you've studied imperialism before in world history, but we're really going to focus in here on the U.S. and what we did um, uh, to make ourselves an empire. The United States Empire at the turn of the 20th century between the 1800s and the 1900s. So first of all, what is imperialism? Can we define it simply and easily? Well, imperialism is a policy in which stronger nations extend their economic, political, or military control over weaker territories, okay? And that's why we have these three signs, economic, political, and military control. And to remember this, here's our main question. In what three ways does an empire try to control its colonies? Through military, economic, and political means. But why did the U.S. want an empire? Why did we want to engage in imperialism? Well, there's, there's four main reasons, four main causes of imperialism in the United States. First off, global competition. We were competing with other empires, France, Spain, Britain. Here you can see a map of the British Empire in the 1920s. Um, a little bit later than the time period we're looking at, the turn of the 20th century, but still, you can see here how vast Britain's empire was. And even today, countries like Australia and Canada um, are part of the, the Commonwealth of the the British Empire. They still trace their connections back to the British Empire, even though they're independent countries on their own now. And the U.S. was competing with countries like this who were trying to spread their influence across the world, and, and we wanted to do the same thing. We also had a desire for military strength. We, and an empire needed a strong military, so the U.S. wanted to build up its military to compete with these European empires. We had to have uh, an equal footing with them. We also had a thirst for new markets and raw materials. The U.S. needed colonies for raw materials. It also needed places to sell its manufactured goods. So we would we would basically come in, take over a place, and make it our colony. And then we would take its raw materials, its timber, its coal, its oil, its iron ore. We would bring that back to the U.S., manufacture our own goods, and then turn around and sell them back to the colonies. And finally, we had a belief in cultural superiority. Many in the U.S. believed that we had the best culture, the best economy, the best government, and especially the best religion in the world, and that we should spread our beliefs to the rest of the world because we shouldn't be the only ones that should be enjoying this uh, prosperity. And again, particularly uh, religion-wise, Christianity, uh, many Christians wanted to ev evangelize, to spread their uh, beliefs to the rest of the world. And... Um, that was one of the main goals, to spread Christianity. So again, what are the four reasons for U.S. imperialism? We have global competition, militarism, thirst for new markets and raw materials, and a belief in cultural superiority. Now, how did the U.S. gain new lands? Well, it wasn't just war. I mean... War was a main re way to gain new lands, but there were other ways we gained land too. First off, we bought things. We bought Alaska from Russia, for example, for $7.2 million, about two cents per acre in 1867. Very 
good deal. No way you could buy an acre of land for two cents per acre in any part of the United States today, I think. Um, and first off, when we bought Alaska, um, it was purchased by a man named William Seward, Secretary of State, and uh, it was called his folly, his mistake. It was also called Seward's Icebox because people looked at Alaska and they thought, it's just cold and, and snow up there. Why would Alaska be valuable? But of course, you know, out, uh, of course, besides its obvious natural beauty uh, of Alaska, it had great mineral and oil wealth, which we really rely on in many cases today. So Alaska is very important state uh, to the United States. Another way, we kind of bullied our way in, in many cases. We didn't fight for it, but we kind of annexed things. Like Hawaii, for example, in 1898, uh, the U.S. Uh, sugar planters there overthrew the island's native monarch, Queen Liliuo Kalani. Here you can see a, a picture over here, the last monarch of Hawaii. And there was no fighting, uh, per se, but there was simply just an annexation. The U.S. sugar planters there kind of just took over. Um, and Hawaii, again, would later on become a state, as you know. Uh, but Hawaii, it, we see it all the time. We think, you know, it's just... It's paradise, and to an extent, it is. It's a beautiful place. But uh, Hawaii has its problems, too, and we're going to show you a little video here just about that. I'm going to go off for, and find a video for a second here. Let's uh, pull up multimedia resources. Let's go to history. Let's go to imperialism. And let's find a video. Here we go. Here we go. Um, I'm looking at homeless crisis in Hawaii sparks state of emergency. It is not uncommon for the governor of Hawaii to declare a state of emergency. But the one the governor declared recently was a little different. The cause wasn't a natural disaster. As Chip Reed shows us, Hawaii's homeless crisis is out of control. This is the Hawaii you usually see on TV. Kirk Caldwell is the mayor of Honolulu. As you can see, things look about as perfect as paradise can be. But just down the street is this, Hawaii's crisis of homelessness. People want to come to paradise. They get here with a job, but they find it's really hard to live here. Buying a home is super expensive. Renting a place is very, very expensive. Many end up on the streets, on beaches, in parks, and in tent cities. There are now more than 7,000 homeless in Hawaii, the highest per capita rate in the nation. About 5,000 of those are packed into Honolulu. Many struggle with drugs, alcohol, and mental illness. Mayor Caldwell says the city is making progress. About 500 homeless were moved into housing over the past year. But recently, the number of homeless families has been soaring. A family of six lives in this van in the parking lot of St. Elizabeth's Episcopal Church in Honolulu. What is the hardest part about living this way? My kids, they don't have space and nights to study their lesson, to their homework. How do they study? They study under the street light. Onena, who did not want her face on camera, says her husband works full-time at a high-end restaurant for minimum wage, but not nearly enough to pay rent here. They've done everything right. They struggle, they work, and there is no housing. Father David Gerlach helps the family survive. It's a government problem, and government has to step up and help fix it. Father Gerlach says he'd like to see a homeless encampment right here in the heart of Waikiki. He says that would force the powerful tourism industry and the politicians to do more for the homeless. Jim? Chip Reed, thank you very much. Okay, so we see Hawaii has its problems. And, you know, we again, we view it as paradise, but it is not all it's cracked up to be, I guess. Finally, the last place I want to focus on is Midway Islands. We gain these through simple exploration. Alaska we bought, Hawaii we just annexed, and Midway Islands we discovered. Uh, we discovered them 
The U.S. was the first to explore them in 1867, and we simply took them for our own. And the Midway Islands become very important during World War II. Um, but again, what territories did the U.S. gain without going to war? That would be Alaska, Hawaii, and the Midway Islands. The U.S. goes to war with Spain to gain new lands. So there's, of course, the reason the U.S. wanted a larger empire, but there were other specific reasons which brought us into a conflict with the Spanish. First, U.S. businessmen owned sugar plantations in Spanish controlled Cuba, and when Spain threatened our business interests there, uh, the U.S. took notice. Here's a picture of Cuba here. Uh, it's a large island just to the south of Florida. Uh, at its closest point, uh, we are only about 90 miles away, and uh, for years people have made the dangerous trip from Cuba to the uh, Florida Keys in order to gain freedom there. But recently the U.S. has had more openness with Cuba and we've uh, reopened uh, embassies there and, and improving relations. So that is possibly a positive thing. Spanish General Valeriano Weiler brutally put down a Cuban revolt in 1896 and then he placed 300,000 Cubans into concentration camps. So it's very important we understand the difference between the Spanish and the Cubans. The Cubans were the people that were living there, um, the natives, so to speak. The Spanish were the ones that had come over, come over and taken control of Cuba. Valeriano Weiler again put these rebels, as he would have called them, in concentration camps. And um, here's a picture of Weiler. Weiler was called a butcher in the U.S. press, and this really made people in the United States angry. They, they wanted to right the wrongs, fix the injustices of Valeriano Weiler. And then we have newspaper editors, Joseph Pulitzer and William Randolph Hearst's, Hearst. And then these two men used yellow journalism, sensationalized reporting to increase the public's demand for war. This meant that any little headline about Spain being bad was blown out of proportion and was used to inflame the public, make them want to go to war with Spain. And we see this today. We see this, you see this on the internet a lot with the different videos on, on YouTube and such. But then you also see that in the uh, checkout line at grocery stores like Weekly World News, space alien skeletons found in desert, new proof of Roswell crash, OJ finds Nicole Simpson's real killer, all of this stuff is sensationalized and designed to make you buy newspapers, whether it's true or not. And, and that's what William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer did. They wanted to, you people to buy their newspapers. Uh, now let's watch a little video about uh, Joseph Pulitzer so that you can kind of understand where this guy was uh, coming from here. So here we go. Here is uh, being Joseph Pulitzer from National Geographic. My name is Joseph Pulitzer. I run a newspaper here in New York City. It is the world you may have heard of it. Before our time, the newspapers were trifles for rich people only. They never told the plight of the regular people in the world, the working class people, the people who strive and struggle. I come from Hungary, from Hungary. We went without many years, and when I came here, I came here without anything. So I know what it's like to go without a meal, to sleep in the cold, the people of means stepped back from their responsibility to the people in the street, those struggling people. And it was my destiny to bring the truth of the common people out. Out from behind the shadows, out from behind their poverty, out from behind their rags, because these are citizens too. And these citizens have no voice. I give them a voice. I give them my paper. I am an American, you say I'm a genius, then fine. That word is rife with misunderstanding. Genius is ingenuity. And ingenuity comes from the willingness to see an opportunity and make something of it. You have to have an iron determination. You have to be able to work hard, long, without rest. 
That's all that is. There's no magic powder dust sprinkled around to make one think of fancy thoughts that no one ever thought. There's nothing like that. Ambition is the key. It's when a man wants to do something great. When a man wants to step above himself. Not above others, above himself. Would I consider Hearst a genius? Hmm. You mean a genius who comes the world handed to him on a silver platter by his mother, wet nurses him, a man who's never had a struggle. He's not a man who has vision. He has a need for his mommy to love him. I think he'll be remembered as a man with ambition, but ambition not tempered with a vision for people or for truth. An ambition solely for oneself. This is the folly of many, many men. And had it not been for his legacy, if it hadn't been for his wealth, would we have ever heard of William Randolph Hearst? I had a rivalry with Hearst, and you ask me, who won? There was no winning. Hearst never showed up for the race. Okay, so there you see a actor portraying Joseph Pulitzer, of course, this happened over a hundred years ago, so Pulitzer is long since gone, but um, I, I like the way it communicates the rivalry between two newspaper editors there, and, and they used Yellow Journal, they used sensationalized reporting to further that rivalry, they wanted to outsell each other. <laughs> going to continue with the causes here. There's a couple more we got to talk about. The next is the loan letter. Uh, this angered the U.S. It was written by the Spanish minister to Cuba and um, obviously his name was the loan and it called President McKinley weak um, and, and he said he would never attack Spain. He wasn't strong enough to do that. And here's a picture of our good old Ohioan our Ohio president, William McKinley, and this really made people angry. It's, like, it's one thing if Americans insult their president, but if someone overseas insults the president, then we, we tend to take notice. And finally, maybe the most, well, no, not maybe, but definitely the most important cause, the destruction of the USS Maine. The Maine had been sent to Cuba to bring home Americans and protect U.S. property. However, its mission was interrupted on February 15, 1898, when it mysteriously exploded. Journalists immediately, Hearst and, and Pulitzer, immediately blamed Spain for the explosion, although we now know that the main exploded from the inside, and its mass there was, was saved, actually, and it was brought to a um, uh, cemetery uh, in Virginia, uh, which you probably visited when you went to visit Washington, D.C., but let's uh, here before we talk any more about that. Let's look at um, uh, a short video about the USS Maine and its short time in Cuba. The battleship USS Maine steamed into Havana Harbor in late January, eighteen ninety-eight. While the United States government claimed the battleship was simply making a courtesy visit to Cuba, the ship had really come to protect American lives and property on the island. Cuban revolutionaries had struggled for decades against their Spanish rulers, who had controlled the island for nearly 400 years. In January of 1898, civilian riots left Havana, Cuba's capital, in turmoil and put American lives and investments at risk. The appearance of one of America's premier battleships, bristling with 10-inch guns, helped reassure U.S. citizens in Havana. The Maine dropped anchor in the harbor, and its crew kept a watchful eye on the island. But three weeks later, on February the 15th, the Maine exploded in a gigantic fireball that echoed throughout Havana's streets. 266 men were killed as the Maine's three forward 6 and 10 inch ammunition storage magazines blew up. America turned suspicious eyes towards Spain. For years, Cuban exiles in America and others sympathetic to their cause have been calling for the United States to force the Spanish out of Cuba. Those calls were fueled by the press, which often presented Spain's leaders as evil or less than human.
When word of the main explosion reached America, some people, including the powerful newspaper owner William Randolph Hearst, immediately blamed Spain. And most of the public believed them. When a team of investigators sent by the Navy concluded that the explosion was the result of a black powder mine, war fever swept across the country. President William McKinley and the U.S. Congress gave in to the public's demands and declared war on April 25, 1898. Within six months, the war was over and Spain was defeated. And the United States was on the road to becoming a world power by gaining Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and the Pacific Islands of Guam and Wake from Spain. But a nagging question remained. No direct evidence linking Spain to the sinking of the Maine had been found. So why had the ship blown up? In the 1970s, the Navy launched a new investigation into the case. Admiral Hyman Rickover concluded that the explosion aboard the Maine was not caused by a mine at all. Instead, the ship sank because of a terrible accident. Using various techniques, modern researchers have confirmed Rickover's conclusion that the blast was probably indirectly caused by a spontaneous combustion fire inside the Maine's coal bunker. That coal fire probably heated the wall of the nearby ammunition magazines, causing the shells to explode. So it apparently was a simple accident that destroyed the ship and set up a chain of events that altered the course of American and world history. So, again, one of the major causes of our war with Spain, and I'd like to just point out, bring up the mast again. The mast was saved and put into Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia, and you may have seen it when you did your eighth grade trip to Washington, D.C. You probably did, but you may not remember it. Uh, but what's interesting is those men um, who died didn't die because of Spain. They probably died because of an accident. And so, we, again, we went to war due to uh, an accident. It was called a splendid little war. If any war can be splendid, I don't quite know how people die in war. I don't think that's very splendid. But for the U.S., I guess it was a success. The U.S. declared war on Spain on the 20th of April, 1898. The war only lasted 16 weeks. It was a very short war. The war did not start in Cuba, though. The war started actually in the Pacific Ocean, thousands of miles away. Commodore George Dewey's fleet destroyed the Spanish naval fleet in the Pacific at Manila, the Philippine capital, on April 30th, 1898. And this would give the U.S. a strategically important military base. Here we see a, a map of the Philippines. It's kind of between Australia and China to the southeast of China, to the southwest of Japan, to the northwest of Australia. And so it's very strategically important, centrally located. And from here, the U.S. can send out ships to many different places. So this would be a piece of land that the U.S. would hold on to for, for decades. And it wasn't until after World War II that the U.S. Uh, allowed the Philippines to have its freedom. And we'll talk more about the Philippines later. The next battle, maybe you're more familiar with Teddy Roosevelt and Leonard Wood's Rough Rider Charge. The Rough Rider Cavalry Troop won a victory at the Battle of San Juan and Kettle Hill on July 1st, 1898. And this would lead to the U.S. conquest of Cuba in the Caribbean. Cuba would never really uh, officially become part of the United States or a territory or, or anything like that. But the U.S. would essentially control it. And here we see a, a famous painting of Theodore Roosevelt on the on the back of his horse. Interestingly enough, most of his rough riders didn't ride horses at the Battle of San Juan and, and Battle of Kettle Hill. They were on foot. The horses, uh, not all, could be brought over from Florida. Spain was faced with great defeats, and they signed a ceasefire on August 12th. 
and the peace treaty for the that would stop the war officially on December 10th. And this would give the U.S. control over Puerto Rico, Guam, Cuba, and the Philippines after the war. And we're going to take a little break here and just uh, look at uh, the Philippines for an instant and see why the Philippines are still important to the U.S. today. The United States and the Philippines have had strong diplomatic ties for decades, but you would never guess that by listening to Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte. Since taking office in June 2016, Duterte has unleashed an aggressive campaign against the United States, threatening to halt joint military exercises and even calling President Obama a, quote, son of a whore. Duterte said bilateral ties are no longer benefiting the Philippines and that he plans to, quote, break up with America. So what led up to this point? How did their relationship get so complicated? Well, ties between the U.S. and the Philippines largely stem back to the late 1800s. At the time, the Philippines was a colony of Spain and was fighting for independence. When American troops arrived during the Spanish-American War, Philippine rebel troops fought alongside them, eventually defeating the Spanish in 1898. However, instead of granting the Philippines freedom, the U.S. claimed it as its own territory and declared war against Philippine revolutionary forces. American troops killed hundreds of thousands of Philippine civilians in a series of alleged war crimes. In one particularly heinous instance, U.S. troops ransacked a residential area, killing anyone who was more than 10 years old. After three years of fighting, the United States won and placed the Philippines under a civilian government. And over time, the Philippines' attitude toward the U.S. significantly improved as the United States fostered economic development and introduced public education, elections, and social programs. By the mid-1930s, the Philippines had become largely autonomous, and the U.S. agreed to grant it full independence within a decade. However, those plans were interrupted with the onset of World War II, during which Japan invaded and occupied the Philippines. American and Philippine troops jointly defeated the Japanese, and in 1946, the Philippines gained full independence. Around the same time, it signed a mutual defense treaty with the U.S., part of which allowed the United States to maintain more than a dozen military bases there. Today, the U.S. and the Philippines are largely tied together by their shared adversary, China. The Philippines and China both hold claims on the resource-rich South China Sea, and in the last several years, China has aggressively pursued island building on these territories. Feeling threatened by China's land grabbing, the Philippines has allowed the U.S. to increase its military presence in the country, including naval and aerial patrols. In general, there is a tremendous amount of goodwill between the two countries. According to a 2015 Pew poll, the Philippines is the most pro-America country in the world, with 92% of its population viewing the U.S. favorably. Experts say this is in part because so many Filipinos have immigrated to the U.S. over the last century. There are an estimated 4 million Filipino Americans living in the U.S making them one of the largest Asian minority populations. The United States has a pointed interest in keeping this relationship strong as the Obama administration continues its strategic effort to bolster diplomatic and security ties with its Asian allies. However, President Duterte's direct insults of Obama and threats to end the U.S.-Philippine defense partnership could mark a new chapter in their complicated history. If you're like me and you love watching wildlife shows, you can check out Animal Planet Go, where you can watch all the seasons current and past of your favorite Animal Planet shows. I'm currently working my way through Whale Wars right now. It's super cool, lots of intrigue and drama. Check out the link in the description below to learn more. So how exactly did President Duterte come to power and why do critics call him the Donald Trump of the Philippines? Find out more about this outspoken politician in this video. He has openly tolerated the killing of alleged criminals by an unauthorized death squad that patrols the city, and has himself said that those committing illegal activity were legitimate targets of assassination. While human rights groups have condemned his remarks and actions, others agree that the Philippine justice system is inadequate to deal with dangerous crime. Duterte has even promised to kill thousands of criminals if elected. Thanks for watching Seeker Daily, everyone. Make sure you like and subscribe so you get new videos from us every day. Okay, so there we see why the Philippines was and is so important to the United States, um, even continuing up to the present day. Um, but for our purposes, for the study of history, after the Spanish-American War, the U.S. had an empire, and that empire stretched from um, the Philippines, uh, all the way to Puerto Rico 
And so it was a huge expanse of land and ocean that uh, are we controlled. And you can see in this cartoon here in 1898, 10,000 miles from tip to tip, the bald eagle's wings spread just that far. That's the area of our dominion. And the U.S. now had an empire, but what would it do with it? Well, we'll see in a, a future lesson uh, what exactly uh, the U.S. would do with its brand new empire. That's it for now. Thanks for paying attention. Well, that's all we have for our notes over imperialism and America at war. Uh, me and my buddy T.R., you know, us guys with glasses, we're distinguished. We got to stay tight. We'd like to say thank you for watching, and uh, make sure that if you haven't done so, click uh, subscribe down below, and uh, make sure you like the video, and pay attention to the channel for further online notes from Mr. Miller. Thanks guys, you have a great day. Bye-bye. Peace.